Hello, my name is David Higgins, and welcome to today's video. I'm going to be presenting a second installment on the philosopher George Holmes Howison. Okay, and in my previous episode about Mr. Howison, I introduced this book, The Limits of Evolution and Other Essays Illustrating the Metaphysical Theory of Personal Idealism. And today I'm going to attempt to tackle the essay titled Human Immortality. Okay? It's positive argument with reference to a lecture by Professor James. And that's William James, the, the American philosopher. Uh, so, uh, just very recently, I read an article, a short essay on a website titled Essentia Foundation which is uh, founded by a fellow named Bernardo Castrop, and this essay is by him. Um, the title of the essay is What Lurks Behind Space-Time. So, you know, he talks about the principle of individuation, which is a philosophical idea that says that uh, it's extremely difficult for us to think apart from time and space because uh, the phenomena of time and space allows us to individuate objects in our experience and therefore think about them. Uh, they need to have form and they need to be present in a certain sequence in order for them to uh, be intelligible. Uh, so uh, Castrop argues that, uh, you know, we seem to have the idea that order exists even apart from space and time and he gives evidence of that order when he asks us to think of meaning, that meaning can exist outside of space-time. It's not, it's, you know, a, a mental reality that's non-spatio-temporal, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> in talking about that mental universe, uh, he uh, talks about and sort of a, what he calls a spontaneous field of mental activity that exists prior to or above or deeper than time and space and that the disposition and attitude of that field of consciousness actually generates the laws of nature okay so using words like disposition and aptitude uh, seems to indicate that uh, his sea of consciousness has some personality. Uh, he doesn't go so far as to say that uh, reality does have personality, but Howison, on the other hand, does. Uh, he was a proponent of what he calls personal idealism. Uh, in his day, the transcendentalists talked about a mother sea of consciousness and that uh, our individual consciousness is basically a limiting a temporary limiting in time and space of that overarching uh, single consciousness. Whereas Howison argued for uh, what he called pluralistic idealism, so that there's a mental basis of the universe, but it's many minds rather than one single mind. Okay, so. Uh, This essay was given in response to a lecture that was presented by William James. Uh, and he was discussing cerebralistic materialism, or materialistic cerebralism, whichever you, well, however you want to say it, which basically says that consciousness is a function of, of that the brain produces consciousness. Okay, uh, that was a popular way to interpret the fact that uh, you know we know that our brains are definitely related to our ability to perceive and be aware. Uh, you know, modern science has a lot of gadgetry that can, you know, map out, you know, electromagnetic activity in the brain in relation to particular sensations and whatnot. So there's definitely a relationship between the brain and consciousness. Uh, and a popular way to think about it is that the brain generates consciousness. 
Uh, and William James argued that maybe we might think about it differently and say that the, or the brain is a transmissive organ and that it permits us to perceive something deeper that exists behind the physical reality uh, and gives rise to the physical reality that the brain is essentially a transmissive organ or a limiting organ which means that the sea of consciousness is limited into an individual consciousness through the organ of the brain and uh, I'm not sure but I, I think Castro probably uh, goes along with that sort of idea uh, but Howison was saying that that's not good enough uh, because consciousness individual consciousness is still dependent on the brain when the brain is no more does individual consciousness then perish so uh, it makes our individual consciousness uh, you know transient and dependent on a physical reality and he argues that uh, our consciousness is not dependent on time and space and the objects of time and space but precludes time and space and in fact he takes it a step farther to say our individual consciousness generates time and space as we experience it individually okay so uh, the article is 35 pages long and it's pretty complicated uh, and it's you know best if you can get the article and r the essay and read it for yourself uh, so the reason that Howison, you know, challenged James's transmissive theory and, and took it to a different level, he, you know, he was saying that, okay, both the brain and consciousness are both simultaneous effects of a prior cause, okay? And Swedenborg, you know, my other uh, influential philosopher, uh, really presents the same idea. Uh, but all four of these guys basically deduce from experience that there are levels of reality. There's the, the time-space level and that there's something prior. Uh, Swedenborg actually hypothesizes three levels of reality, three distinct levels, but we'll just stick to two. You know, I suggest that you read Swedenborg if you want, you know, to read something that will give you uh, a much deeper analysis of reality uh, his book divine love and wisdom speaks extensively about the three levels of reality and i'm not going to go into that now because it's very complex uh, but we'll just discuss howison's uh, presentation of two levels of reality and show how it goes along with swedenborg and how it goes along with our own individual experience so uh, he, he spends some time analyzing time okay and time and space are of this outer level of reality. And he says that time and space arise from a cause prior to themselves there. And that that is where our higher self resides or the soul. Okay, so uh, when he's saying that our soul exists on a level of reality that precludes time that supports the idea that we are therefore not time dependent uh, but we are instead immortal and he uh, you know does a pretty darn good job of course it's 35 pages and there's no you know like wasted verbiage there uh, but it is complex okay so uh, he starts out by saying, okay, look, there's no way that we can imagine time uh, to not exist, right, our, in our lower self, right, uh, because our lower self and time are essentially co-existing, okay, uh, and it's part of our individuation, personal individuation pro process, okay, we establish our self in relation to others and in relation to events and uh, we place ourselves in a sequence and 
through that we gain a sense of identity which we embrace okay so uh, the creation of, of the sequence is essentially the activity of the soul creating its own individual identity in relation to others you know others that exist simultaneously with us and others that have you know manifested in a series prior to us okay so uh, you know these sequencing you know activities of the soul are essentially subconscious so we start out with our consciousness in time and space okay we're aware of we become aware as children of ourselves existing in this time space reality okay and it seems as if you know we had no uh, choice but to be born in this way whereas what Kastrup is suggesting is that somehow our deeper self actually participated in the time self the time space self manifesting in the manner in which it does uh, and Swedenborg you know says something similar when he says that the natural world represents our more essential level the spiritual level and the quality of it so uh, what we're perceiving with our senses is actually an image of a deeper element of self which most of us are unaware that even exists okay so he says we all have this spiritual level a part of us and but not everybody has their state elevated to the point where they actually are aware of that level so as a person becomes wise as they learn more about themselves this secondary or inner level uh, begins to open to our personal consciousness uh, and so once we understand the source of the time self more clearly we can see that because time and space arrive arise from this deeper element that isn't time dependent we can be rationally certain that that non time dependent self will continue to exist even when the creation the created time comes to an end at death okay so death uh, is essentially a point on the timeline and that just means that the soul then becomes free of that timeline it doesn't mean that the soul itself ceases to exist okay so he's saying that that sequential ordering ability that we have uh, is an element of our foundational being okay uh, the ability to create time and space so you know the notion that we create space uh, is something that we can sort of you know deduce you know it's pretty obvious when we look at you know the state of the environment that uh, the state of our collective mind is reflected in society uh, one of my other favorite books is called the social construction of reality it's written by Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman and it's a, it's a sociology book but it can be read metaphysically and I highly recommend that you acquire that book and read it I have it right here I'll show you what what it looks like okay this is the social construction of reality okay this book is excellent and especially if you're willing to read it more metaphysically than just as a sociology work because okay so what he basically argues is that reality is formed by uh, the collective societal knowledge okay so we all agree what is real okay and we we form definitions and we set a structure social structure and we take our own individual identity in relation to those definitions uh, and so humanity society and reality are all essentially identical and they all kind of coexist and all 
sort of create one another, okay? And, you know, his arguments are really clear and convincing. And, and I'm going to post an essay that uh, is basically the basis of this video lecture. Uh, and I, I present a whole number of quotes from that book uh, to try to entice you to get the book and read it for yourself. But, uh, you know, that reality is produced by the collective mind is the basic conclusion. Uh, and, you know, that's pretty easy to see when we look at things like cities or pollution, you know, this, you know the state of, of the civilized world, you know, but uh, Swedenborg, you know, argues that the natural world, which seems to be generated not by human endeavor, you know, mountains and seas, these sorts of things weren't physically created by men, whereas like things like airplanes or, you know, buildings were. Uh, but Swedenborg argues that those things are essentially outbirths of our inner mind, okay? That things like the ocean and the mountains and wild animals represents uh, the qualities that exist within us subconsciously and, and that the visible uh, manifestation is essentially a symbolic rendering of things that exist within our deeper selves. Uh, and time and space are likewise generated through our own inner qualities. Uh, and, you know, like, you can see how, you know, our experience of time is entirely subjective. Because if you're involved in, like, an engaging activity uh, where you're experiencing, you know, pleasure in the activity, then time seems to go much faster, okay? And, uh, and the flip side of that is when, you know, you're involved in some sort of distasteful drudgery, you know, time seems to drag on, okay? So time is reflecting your own inner states and it's essentially being created by your own inner states. Uh, and, you know, Castro, you know, talks about how meaning creates the laws of nature, okay? Uh, and I had some examples where, okay, let's see if I can find it here in my notes, but uh, I think I had it written down pretty succinctly. <laughs> but looking for them is not succinct, and I'm sorry to waste your time. Somehow it, it doesn't seem like it got on this outline. So I have, a, I have an outline, and then, then I have the actual essay. Uh, but let's see if I can wing it. Uh, so the laws of nature being product of the disposition and aptitude of the spontaneous field of mental activity. You know, I think that's a pretty good paraphrase of, of something that Castro says in his essay. Uh, let's apply that to the case of the Wright brothers. They had a spontaneous mental activity that created within themselves a vision of man flying. Uh, and so their disposition and aptitude was energetically applied to reality. And they essentially discovered the laws of nature, uh, aerodynamics. Uh, and these laws weren't really known to that point. So their disposition and aptitude, their determination to fly created laws that they could work within to create what their spontaneous field of mental activity had, you know, inspired. Okay, so reality took form according to their mental state. Okay, uh, and so they essentially became responsible for, you know, the laws of nature that were hitherto unknown, 
Uh, and if something is basically unknown, it, it, it really doesn't exist. You know, it don't, things only exist when you know about them. Okay, so we didn't know about, you know, aerodynamics. Uh, the Wright brothers framed them first in their own minds and then expressed them verbally to their, you know, co-workers and, and people who teamed up with them. And they essentially created a reality that allowed man to fly. Uh, so, you know, space, the, the meaning of space took on a whole new reality following the Wright brothers' creation of the laws of aerodynamics. Uh, so, you know, uh, they, you can see how the Wright brothers created our current idea of space, our current ability to move in space and exist in space. Okay, so, uh, you know, maybe this all seems like, you know, smoke and mirrors, but it's not. And, you know, I've definitely experienced, you know, how time and space uh, are created by my own ideas and attitudes, you know. Uh, and, you know, so anyway, if you take the time to read this essay, I think that you will really gain... A confidence that your personal identity as a thinking, moving, creative being is not time dependent and therefore you are immortal and you will cease to fear the grave or cease to fear the, the changes that you're experiencing around you in recognizing that they're part of your own creative unfolding of your of your self okay uh, and yourself the qualities of it uh, is made clear through you know a variety of contexts and requires you know the experience of childhood adolescence adulthood and old age in order to clearly define who you are in essence uh, and so you know, the body that we inhabit, the, the society and the environment that we inhabit are all part of the process of us realizing our own, you know, individuality. And, you know, time and space are just markers on that uh, experience of reality. So, you know, please read that essay and uh, you won't regret it. So anyway, I hope this video is helpful and my next attempt will be to tackle uh, his, the final essay in that book, which is titled Harmony of Determinism and Freedom. Okay, so he takes on the idea that uh, we have true freedom true and complete freedom. Uh, you know, he believed in the divine. Uh, he believed in God, is what I'm saying. Uh, but of course, the definition of God is one that we need to be very careful with. So he, you know, discusses, you know, it's popular to say that God is omniscient and omnipotent, meaning he has, he holds all the power and he knows everything. Okay, so if that's true, how is it that we can be anything other than either robots or puppets? Uh, and so he tackles that, you know, conundrum, and he does it quite well, and shows that God can be omnipotent and omniscient in a way that allows us real, true freedom and creative existence, that we are autonomous, that we are not controlled by God, and, you know, the way in which those things interact in his essay is really something quite profound. So I'm going to start working on that one, you know, get my thoughts organized about it. And hopefully within another week or so, I'll present another video about that. So anyway, uh, thanks for your attention. And please like and subscribe. And we'll see you again sometime soon.